Hello, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic operations management. Now, three things before we get started. Number one, if you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class right now, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. If you're watching this, it means you have come pretty far in your schooling up to this point, and you may have just hit a temporary rough patch. So I know, with the right amount of hard work, practice, and patience, you can get through it. I have faith in you. Others have faith in you, so so should you. Number two, please feel free to follow me here on YouTube and or on Twitter. That way when I upload a new video, you know about it. And on the topic of the video, if you like it, please give it a thumbs up, put it on a playlist, or share it. That does encourage me to keep making them. On the flip side, if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below the video, and I will try to take that into account when I make new ones. And finally, just keep in mind that these videos are meant for people who are relatively new or just looking to review or refresh on these topics. So I'll just be going over the very basic concepts, and I will be doing so in a slow, deliberate manner. Not only do I want you to understand what's going on, but why. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is a very basic introduction to decision analysis, and more specifically, sort of quantitative decision analysis. So if this is your first look into this topic, don't worry. It's actually very simple math that we're going to be doing, but I want to explain it in a way that sort of builds upon each step. So we're going to start very simple, then we'll do a little bit more complex part of the problem, and then finally we'll end with something that's really to be honest, not that, not that difficult. So we'll, we'll break it down in two steps so they're easy to understand. But again, this is just a very basic beginning introduction to decision analysis. Now the thing is, we face these kind of decisions in our everyday life all the time. So let's say you're taking a drive from Louisville, Kentucky to Chicago, Illinois, and this is a, a route I take often. Now, once you approach Indianapolis, which is about halfway in between the two, you kind of have to make a decision. Am I going to drive right through the heart of the city? Am I going to go around the city to the north? Or am I going to go around the city to the south? Now, the question is, which route should you choose? What factors will influence your decision? So, of course, with something like this, it may be, you know, the time of day. If you're approaching a big city during rush hour, you're more likely to take one of the routes around the city. If it's late at night or in the middle of the day, you might be inclined to go through the middle of the city because it's shorter. So, again, we face these decisions in life all the time. Most of them are very mundane but we do make decisions all the time, whether we think about what we're doing or not. Well, the next thing is, how certain are you that those factors will exist? So if we go through the middle of the city and we're concerned that there may be heavy traffic in the middle of the city, how certain are we that that will be the case? If we go around the city, how certain are we that it would be clear? Um, how certain are we that it is, in fact, a faster way around even though it's longer. So we have to decide which route we should choose based on a number of factors and then the probability that those factors do or do not exist. And again, we do this every day without thinking about it, but that is the fundamental basis of decision analysis. So here's another example. You work for an investment services firm that is interested in investing in new assets. So how should you allocate your investment? So some decision factors you might think about. What will be the state of the overall economy in the near future? Will it be a boom economy, a bust economy, or sort of a flat economy? Which business sectors look the most promising? Are financial firms really good right now? Are tech companies really good right now? transportation stocks, whatever it might be. So what asset looks good at the moment? What will government fiscal and monetary policy be? How will the Federal Reserve 
make decisions on interest rates? Will the U.S. government figure itself out and actually get the fiscal crisis we're having right now in order? Now, which investments are most attractive from a tax and legal perspective? So again, all these type of decisions and many others, of course, could go into deciding how you allocate your investment. Now, the one we're going to use today is about the example of a mining company. So you work for a mining company that is currently evaluating new locations for mining operations. What about some decision factors here? Number one, should you hire a geologist to obtain an independent analysis? So oftentimes mineral companies and oil companies will hire outside geologists and things of that nature to do assessments on the state of the earth, whether or not oil might be there or certain minerals might be there and things like that. How likely is it that minerals are present in any given location? Now, if the minerals are indeed present, is there enough there to justify the cost of actually drilling or digging for it? What are the current labor conditions in the region? And that could be an influence of whether or not you set up shop in a place to actually drill or mine. So these are just, you know, some off the top things I could think of. But again, there are many more. But these are all decisions that would go into a mining operation. So what exactly is decision analysis? Well, what it is, it's a method for reducing uncertainty in the decision-making process through some data analysis. And again, the data we're going to use in this one is very simple. But the only other option would be to just randomly choose. Well, we obviously do not want to do that. So decision analysis helps us reduce that uncertainty through reason to sort of rationally decide based on some data we might have. It provides a rational process for making decisions that is usually far better than random selection. It's easy to update if conditions change. So in the chart we make in this video, it's really easy to just change a few numbers in it and redo the analysis. Now in this video, we're going to cover five main topics. We're going to cover what's called the Maxi-Max Criterion, the Maxi-Min Criterion, the Equally Likely Criterion, the Expected Monetary Value, and the Expected Value of Perfect Information. So these are the five main ideas or methods we're going to discuss in this video. Now the first two, the Maxi-Max and Maxi-Min, do not involve any probabilities, and the last three do. But we're going to walk through each one using a very simple example. So we'll call this Gold Digger just for fun. So Luster Incorporated is a small mining company that purchased tracts of land. Larger mining companies thought were not worth their time or money. A consulting geologist has determined that there is a 20% chance the tract contains a profitable gold deposit. Now, mining at this location would require an investment of $80,000. If there is no gold, all $80,000 then would be lost. However, if gold is present, the geologist estimates enough to generate $600,000 in profit for the company. So we can see here, we have a company that has some tract of land. They hired a geologist that estimates there's a 20% chance the tract has profitable gold deposits. The company's figured out ahead of time that setting up a mining location here, a small one, would cost $80,000. And of course, if there's no gold, then they lose all that $80,000. But if there is, they're going to generate a nice profit. Now the final catch is that a larger mining company has learned of this report and is willing to buy the land outright right now. And that would generate an immediate $75,000 profit and it would eliminate the risk of finding no gold. So depending on how Luster Incorporated felt 
they could just sell this land right now that would generate a $75,000 profit for them and it would obviously eliminate the risk of finding no gold there. Now, of course, once they sell it, they would sacrifice the probability of, of actually finding gold there. So you can see they have a decision to make, sort of a trade-off. And this is the decision we're going to use in this video. So the first thing we do is we set up what's called a decision table. And it has three main parts. Now down the rows, we have the alternative decisions. So this is what could we do? Now in this case, they could either mine the land or sell the land. Those are the two alternative decisions. So those are the rows across our table here. At the top, we have what are called states of nature. And these are things that are pretty much, if not all the way, out of control of the deciding agent or the deciding person. So whether or not there is gold in the ground or no gold in the ground is out of the hands of the company. Okay, that's literally a state of nature. But those will sort of go at the top of our columns. Now along the bottom, in this case, we have what are called prior probabilities. So these are the probabilities that the geologist gave the company. So you can see that in the gold column, we have a probability of 0.2. In the no gold column, we have a probability of 0.8. And again, that just aligns with the information we have. Now, of course, you can see in the middle, we have the payoff for each combination of decision and state of nature. So if the company decides to mine the land and there is gold in the ground, then that means a profit of $600,000. Now, if they mine the land and there's no gold, that's a loss of $80,000 because of the setup costs. Now, if they sell the land, it really doesn't matter if there's gold or not. So the payoff is $75,000 in each case. So if they sell the land at $75,000, whether there's gold or not, because they're not going to be mining for it. So we have alternative decisions. We have states of nature along the top. We have prior probabilities along the bottom. And in the middle, we have our actual payoffs for each combination of decision and state of nature. Now, a few terms here, alternatives. These are the options available to the decision maker. Oftentimes, do nothing is a viable option. Now, again, I guess the company could sit on this land and not sell it or mine it. And, of course, that wouldn't really cost them anything. And they could decide what to do later. Now, a state of nature. Those are random factors outside of the control of the decision maker that nonetheless influence the outcome of the decision. So whether there's gold in the ground or not is Mother Nature's doing. It's not the decision makers. But, of course, it does influence the outcome of the decision. Prior probabilities. These are the relative likelihood of each possible state of nature. So in this case, gold is 20% or 0.2. No gold is 80% or 0.8. And of course, the probabilities must add up to 1. Now, most often is expressed as estimist based on some secondary information, like a geologist report or maybe a government information report or something like that. But again, it's not always available. And of course, the payoff is the quantitative result for each alternative or state of nature combination. So depending on which alternative is chosen and the state of nature that aligns with that alternative, that would be the payoff for that combination of choice and state of nature. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at is very simple. It's called the Maxi-Max Criterion. Now this decision is for the hopeless optimist. What is the best that could happen? And in this one, no probabilities are involved. So what is the best that could happen in our decision? Well, of course, the best thing that could happen is we mine the land and there's gold there. So under the Maxi-Max criterion, we would choose to mine the land because that gives us the highest payoff 
of $600,000. Again, it's very straightforward, very simple. So it's just a maximum payoff from any state of nature for each decision. So basically you look in your payoffs and you would pick the one with the highest payoff, the highest outcome. That's the maxi-max criterion. Now we have the maxi-min criterion. Now this is the decision for the hardened pessimist or the very cautious. What is the best of the worst that can happen? So what is the best of the worst that can happen? And again, no probabilities are involved in this. So we look at what's the worst that could happen for each decision. Well, if we mine the land and there's no gold there, that would be definitely the worst uh, outcome there. And we would lose $80,000. Now for selling the land, the worst that could happen is 75,000. It's also the best that could happen. So that would be $75,000. Now, what is the best out of those worst possible outcomes? Well, it's to sell the land. That is the best of the worst. So it's the best minimum payoff from any state of nature for each decision alternative. Just think of the maxi min is the best of the worst. Now the maximum likelihood criterion. So now we're going to involve our probabilities. So given the state probabilities, which state of nature is most likely to occur? And then what is the best payoff in that state? So here we look at our probabilities. Which state of nature is most likely to occur? Well, that would be no gold. What's the best payoff in that state? Well, it's definitely not losing $80,000. It would be $75,000 from selling the land. So under the maximum likelihood criterion, we would choose to sell the land because the probability is highest that there is no gold there. Now the equally likely is kind of similar. Now given even state probabilities and using a weighted average, what is the best payoff? So in this case, we kind of pretend the state probabilities are even. Now given the data we have, we know that they are 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, but in the equally likely scenario, we set them to be the same. So in this case, we have two states of nature, so there would be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. If we had three states of nature, it would be one-third, one-third, one-third. This is what we call the equi equally likely criterion. So we set the probabilities to be even, in this case 0.5. Now what we do is we find the weighted average for each decision. So for the mine the land decision, we have a $600,000 payoff under the gold state of nature. Since the probability is 0.5, we multiply that by 0.5. Then we go over to the no gold, where we would lose $80,000. We multiply that by the probability of no gold, which is 0.5. So we just do that weighted average across, and we come up with an expected payoff of $260,000. It's just a weighted average. Then we do the same for sell the land. 75,000 times 0 0.5 plus 75,000 times 0 0.5 is of course $75,000. So under the equally likely criterion, we would choose to mine the land. So let's say you're really, you really like risk and you don't have the probabilities of gold under the ground. So you decide, well, I'll just flip a coin. I'll just flip a coin. So 50-50. If that's how you made your decisions, this is exactly what you would do. So you would have the probability of gold or no gold, 0.5 and 0.5. You're more daring than I am. So in this case, we would dig baby dig. We would go ahead and dig for gold. Now we're going to get a tad more complicated. So the expected monetary value or the EMV. So given the state probabilities and using a weighted average, what is the best payoff? Now we do not have perfect information. We just have our best analysis, which in this case came from the geologist. 
So now we actually put in the probabilities that we were given by the geologist. And we do actually the same thing as the equally likely. So in this case, the probability of gold is 0.2. Probability of no gold is 0.8. And again, we just find the weighted average. So for mine the land and gold, the payoff is $600,000 times 0.2 plus negative, or you can just do minus, $80,000 times 0.8. And when we calculate that, we have an expected monetary value of mining the land of $56,000. Now we go ahead and do the same thing for sell the land. So $75,000 times 0.2 plus $75,000 times 0.8. And of course that is $75,000. Now the basic idea behind the EMV process is that if we were to make this decision over and over and over again, what we would expect the monetary value to be. So in this case, what we're saying is that based on the probabilities and the payoffs, really the expected monetary value of selling the land is higher. So the probability of, you know, finding gold is, is too low really to even make up for the $600,000 payoff. And of course, that means the loss of 80000 carries a lot more weight. And what that does is it drags down our EMV for mining the land, and actually selling the land is the better decision under these probabilities. So again, it would just depend on the probabilities you get from a geologist or from an economist or whatever the problem you have might be. The last thing we're talking about is the value of perfect information. So solid quality, reliable information can be hard to come by. Firms often hire specialists, consultants, and academics to use their expertise in order to greatly improve the quality of the fundamental data. So again, geologists, economists, assessment specialists, um, you can think of many types of, of you know, experts that are hired by companies to generate some data for them. Now, the reason they do that, the reason the companies do that, is to reduce risk and to increase certainty. So it's moving from a decision made in the dark to a decision at least made by candlelight. It may not be, you know, full-blown, you know, fully lit, perfect, you know, you can see everything, but it keeps you from having to guess or make decisions in darkness. So often they hire these individuals to help them with that process. But the question is, what is the value of getting perfect information? What should a company be willing to pay for such perfect information? This is called the EVPI, or the expected value of perfect information. So how do we calculate this? Now, the EVPI is what with what's called the expected value under certainty, which we'll do here first, minus the maximum EMV, which we actually figured out before. Let's talk about the expected value under certainty, the purple part there. So how do we do this? Now the first thing we do is we choose the best alternative for each state of nature. So let's look at the gold state of nature. Well, what is the best outcome, the best alternative? Well, for that, it's mine the land, which is $600,000. Now we go over to the no gold state of nature. What's the best outcome there? Well, for no gold, the best outcome is $75,000, which is sell the land. So we choose the best alternative for each state of nature. Then we multiply that payoff by the probability of the corresponding state of nature. So for gold, $600,000 times 0.2. So we have an expected value under certainty of $120,000. Now for the no gold, we have $75,000 times 0.8. And that gives us an expected value under certainty of $60,000. So again, this is if we had perfect information every time. If we knew there was gold, we would choose mine the land. 
If we knew there was no gold, we would choose sell the land. If we do it again, we find we, we know that there's no gold, we would sell the land. Doing it again, we find that there's gold, mine the land. So we would have perfect information each time. Now we can value that based on the payoff. So for mine the land, it's $120,000. For sell the land, it's $60,000. Now, we do that for each state of nature. So if we had more states of nature, we would do it for all of them. So when we add those together, we have $180,000. So that is the expected value under certainty. So there's our equation again. Now, we just have to find the maximum EMV, which we actually already did. So when we do the EMV again, we find that $75,000 is the maximum EMV. So the EVPI, the expected value of perfect information, is $180,000 minus $75,000, or $105,000. So, therefore, if Luster hired a geologist who was able to provide perfect information with respect to the probabilities of finding or not finding gold, the most they should be willing to pay is $105,000. Now, in the real world, is the company going to be willing to pay $105,000? Well, probably no. Okay, they're probably going to pay less than that. And the reason that is the case is that the geologist who is very smart and very accomplished, I'm sure, is still making a decision that has some risk or uncertainty in it. So the company would not be willing to pay the full $105,000 for perfect information because information is not going to be perfect. So they're probably going to pay less than that. But if, in theory, they could get perfect information, this is the maximum they would be willing to pay for it. Now, of course, this assumes the payoff amounts for each alternative state combination is correct. So in that table there, the expected payoff, you know, those monetary values, we're assuming that those are correct because, of course, those are all involved in these calculations. So again, there's probably, um, there's certainly some uncertainty, interesting way to put it, some, you know, uncertainty in those numbers as well. Okay, so that wraps up a basic introduction of quantitative decision analysis. And when I say quantitative, I mean, obviously we're using numbers and doing calculations, but again, they're very simple. But these are some of the first things you're going to come across when you learn decision analysis, either in an op you know, management class um, or maybe in a, even a stats class, a business stats class or something like that. So I just wanted to give you this basic introduction if you're using it for a review or something along those lines, you know, they would, it's a simple way to sort of think about it and, and see it. So just a few things, and then we'll wrap this thing up. If you're struggling in a class, just stay positive. I know you can do it. So should you. Remember, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, put it on a playlist or something like that. That does encourage me to keep making them. On the flip side, if you think there is something I can do, Please leave a constructive comment below the video, and I'll try to incorporate that into future videos. And finally, just remember that the fact that you're here trying to learn, trying to improve yourself, trying to get smarter, trying to be better, that is what's important. And always keep that in mind as you do your work. So all that being said, I want to thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.